Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload on this 16th day of May, 2019. Now, I know there's been a lot of stuff going on politically. For a change, we're just not going to talk about it. And it's real simple. Um, I have to thank a friend of mine, Tom Shopper, for uh, bringing me up to Cromwell in northern Minnesota uh, yesterday where I had given a, uh, two lectures on the Civil War. And uh, one is on Gettysburg. For the viewers of North Star Oasis, we've covered Gettysburg quite a bit, so we're not going to play that one today. But um, I did another one for a different class that was on Appomattox and beyond, uh, and, and the beginning of Reconstruction. And that's really what we're going to focus on today, because there's a lot of fascinating stuff. And it puts into perspective kind of the entire Civil War in less than an hour. And so that's really what we're going to go on today. Uh, this is the material that I presented to the students at uh, Cromwell High School yesterday. And I'm hoping that you'll find it as informative as the students did. But in order to get to that point, we're going to go with our Prager University segment for today. But keeping with the same theme, we're going to look at the amazing life of Ulysses Grant. The year was 1862. America was in the depths of the Civil War. Looking back, it's easy to believe that a Union victory was inevitable. The North had more money, more population, more industry, but no one thought that at the time. In the first year of the war, it looked as if the South would win. A series of high-profile victories in the East convinced many that Confederates were better fighters under better leaders. Where would President Lincoln find a battlefield general who could do for the Union what Robert E. Lee was doing for the Confederacy? Lead it to victory. The man he found, the man who saved the Union, was Ulysses S. Grant. He wasn't Lincoln's first choice, or second, or third. In fact, when the war started in 1861, Lincoln had no idea who Ulysses S. Grant was. Hardly surprising, since at the time, Grant was selling hats to farmers' wives in a small town in Illinois. His rise to glory is one of the most amazing stories in American history. Born in Ohio on April 27, 1822, Grant had no ambition to be a soldier. His father pushed him into it, thinking he wasn't suited for much else. Grant's West Point career wasn't especially distinguished either. But during the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848, Grant proved himself to be an officer of unusual ability. He was cool under fire, daring but rarely reckless. Even more important, the men under his command trusted him. After that war, Grant returned to St. Louis to marry his fiancée, Julia Dent, the daughter of a slave-owning Missouri farmer. Grant was never happier than when he was with Julia, and he was never unhappier than when he was not. Unfortunately, in this period, army life forced them to be separated, sometimes for many months. To assuage his loneliness, Grant started to drink. While in a distant posting in Northern California, a thousand miles from Julia, his drinking got the better of him. He resigned his army commission to avoid an embarrassing court-martial. It was downhill from there, one business venture failing after another. By 1860, thoroughly humiliated and with no money and no prospects, he was back working for his father in the small town of Galena, Illinois. Then the Civil War happened. The Union was in desperate need of experienced soldiers. Grant volunteered. His leadership skills were immediately obvious. He quickly advanced through the ranks. In a little more than six months, he scored two major victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson along the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. He followed these up with victory in the largest battle in American history up to that time, the Battle of Shiloh, making him a true Union hero in a cause that was starved for heroes. There was nothing flashy about Grant's generalship. All he did was win. Unlike the overly cautious generals that drove President Lincoln to distraction, Grant's battle plan was to always move forward, always put pressure on his foes. Any advantage the Union had in technology or manpower, he employed to the fullest. Like Napoleon, Grant was a superb reader of maps. He could identify the enemy's vulnerabilities and exploit them, as he did in his brilliant 1863 campaign for Vicksburg, a campaign that is still studied at war colleges. In March 1864, Lincoln made Grant commander of all the Union armies. It took more than a year of the war's hardest fighting before Lee surrendered and the war finally came to an end. By this point, the president and his general had developed a close bond. Shortly after Grant returned to Washington, 
Lincoln invited the Grants to join him and Mary Lincoln at Ford's Theater. Grant accepted. Julia, however, had developed an intense dislike for Mary Lincoln and insisted that her husband get out of the commitment. Embarrassed, Grant did. That night, in that theater, Lincoln was assassinated. As the commander of all Union armies, Grant was placed in a terrible bind, having to walk a tightrope between new President Andrew Johnson's pro-South agenda, which favored the old white aristocracy, and protecting, as Lincoln intended, the newly won rights of the freed slaves. Grant had saved America once as a general. Could he save it again as a politician? Running as the Republican candidate for president, Grant easily won election in 1868, and then again in 1872. During his tenure, he fought to secure the passage of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed all American citizens the right to vote, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. He created the Department of Justice, broke up the Ku Klux Klan, and advocated for the rights of Indians. He presided over the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad and a rapidly expanding industrial economy. But Grant wasn't done. One week before his death, on July 23, 1885, he completed his autobiography. It became one of the best-selling books of the 19th century. Of Grant's amazing life, Frederick Douglass wrote a fitting epithet. In him, the Negro found a protector, the Indian a friend, a vanquished foe a brother, an imperiled nation a savior. I'm Gary Edelman, Director of History and Education at the Civil War Trust for Prager University. And so that is the life of Ulysses Grant, who we're going to talk a, a lot more about in this next uh, hour. Anyhow, we're going to go ahead and uh, put up the first slide. And it's going to take a second here. There we go. And just go right to the next one. So we are going to spend a lot more time talking about the, the two people that you see on your screen. On your left is Ulysses Grant, and on the right is Robert E. Lee, who commanded the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. And we're going to spend actually more time, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, we're going to talk more about uh, Grant than anybody. For the main reason that Grant actually was the victor in the fight against Lee, the two, the two were very competent generals, but they had very different fighting styles. And that really came to a head in 1864, in June of 1864 at the Battle of Cold Harbor. But we're going to get into that one a little bit later. Right now, let's take a look, a closer look at Grant. And we're going to start off in 1861, November 7th, with the Battle of Belmont. And that's where Grant's forces surrounded the Confederates, and then they overwhelmed them inside a small outpost. This is a theme that is going to be, uh, go back, this is a theme that we're going to be uh, visiting quite often uh, throughout uh, Ulysses Grant's time as uh, a as a well, as a general. Uh, at that time in 1861, he was a uh, brigadier general, and he had enlisted as, well, enlisted. He joined the Army as a colonel of the 21st Illinois Infantry Regiment, and then quickly was promoted to the Brigadier General of Volunteers. And that's, where, that's his rank at the time. And if we can go back to that previous slide, if you take a look at the blue, that is where Grant had dispatched his forces. And if you take a look at the red, that's where the Confederates were. And we're going to see the common theme. The Union Army under Grant will surround the Confederates. He does that constantly. And that was really the secret to his Western-style campaigning. Uh, he did that in November of 61. And next slide. And he did that in February of 62 at Forts Henry and Donaldson. If you look at the map on the bottom on your far left is Fort Henry. And then they landed there uh, February what, 6th and surrounded Fort Henry. And there was a pathway for escape for the Confederates. And they ran over to nearby Fort Donaldson, which is on your far right on the, on the bottom. And Grant had the army chasing after the Confederates, and then when they, they got to Fort Donaldson, what did they do? 
Take a look at the uh, top right. They surrounded the Confederates and essentially starved them out. It became a siege, and next thing you know, by the 16th of February, the Confederates were forced to surrender. And, you know, Union troops surround the garrison. That is, again, the modus operandi. It happens constantly with um, Ulysses Grant. Now, uh, before we go to the next slide, I just need to pull up something. So hold on just a second. So letting my computer go here. Okay, and then uh, come back to me. After Fort Donaldson, Grant was making a raid on the Confederate Supply Depot at Corinth, Mississippi, which is the you know, very northern part of, of uh, Mississippi, the was it north, uh, northeast or northwest corner. And when they got there in uh, April 6th, they didn't get to Corinth. They landed at Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, they, took a steamboat down and landed in uh, Tennessee, and they were going to march the six to ten miles into Corinth. But Grant was waiting for Don Carlos Buell to come over, and he was a day away. So instead, well, it was the 5th of, uh, of April when they actually did the landing, and so instead of actually building up a defensive uh, work, they just drilled the troops and let them lay out in the open fields. And that was when El Confederate General Al Albert Sidney Johnston came through and did a invasion first. Johnston knew, knew that the Union troops had landed. He put his army on the march and pretty much caught Grant with his pants down. And that was the Battle of Shiloh. It was a two-day affair. It was the bloodiest battle in American history up until that time. If Don Carlos Buell would have arrived on time and not been delayed, Grant would have laid siege to Corinth. That was where the Confederate Supply Depot was. He would have taken the entire Union Army with the, the three armies or whatever he had, every, every troop he had available, he would have surrounded Corinth and forced Albert Sidney Johnston to surrender. It had already worked at Belmont. It worked at Fort Donaldson and uh, Fort Henry. It should have worked at Corinth, but Albert Sidney Johnston put an end to that. Now, the commander that Grant reported to was Henry Halleck, and Halleck he had his issues with Grant. It may have been over Grant's drinking or it just may have been a little bit of an inferiority complex because Grant was actually forcing surrenders and getting some victories. I'm not sure which. Uh, but nonetheless, Grant was removed from command after Shiloh. It was embarrassing to actually lose so many troops. And even though it was a victory by, being, by still staying on the ground, so it, was, it fit a classic definition of a victory, the fact that Albert Sidney Johnston was not defeated was not really, it was, it was kind of a victory in name only. So from there, Halleck removed Grant from command, but then Grant was restored in July of 1862, and then went into Iuka, Mississippi, and did the same thing. Pretty much laid siege to the town and captured the Confederates. After Iuka, in, uh, in the fall, in September of uh, 62, then Grant set his sights on Vicksburg. And Vicksburg was a long, drawn-out affair. It took a long time of going through swamps to get there. And so by the spring of 1863, uh, Grant was starting to have some progress. And let's uh, show the next slide. So if you see here... Um, it kind of starts off with arrives hard times April 28th. That's uh, right over at um, where it says Louisiana on your uh, left side of your screen. And then from there, 
crosses the Mississippi River. Um, well, we have the Union Fleet bombards Grand Gulf April 29th, moving away from Vic Vicksburg, and then down uh, even uh, lower at uh, Brunsburg, crosses the Mississippi River on April 30th, and then moves east over to the Battle of uh, Port Gibson May 1st, and then a long stretch up to the Battle of Raymond on May 12th. Then from there, the Battle of Jackson, and then cross over from Jackson over to Champion Hill on May 16th. The next day is the Battle of the Big Black River Bridge, May 17th. And then we begin the Siege of Vicksburg, May 18th to July 4th. And so that was the prelude to the siege at Vicksburg. And it continued his Western style campaigning. And let's show the slide. Vicksburg essentially comes down to surround them, assault them, starve them out, and force the surrender. And like I mentioned, it happened at Belmont. It happened at uh, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. It should have happened at Corinth. It happened at Iuka. So for Grant to go into Vicksburg, he is going to do exactly what got him you know, uh, some promotions and got and put them on the map. And he surrounded Vicksburg. And if you see all that red, that's uh, Confederate General John Pemberton. And uh, Pemberton had his back up against the uh, bluffs of the Mississippi River. And there was really no avenue of escape. That um, Grant with uh, Sherman, McPherson, McClendon had surrounded him. And it got to the point where it was so bad for Pemberton's forces that some of the troops and the citizens of Vicksburg were uh, digging um, caves in the hills, in the bluffs. They were hiding out from the Union bombardment. They were starving. There wasn't a whole lot of food left to eat. And then on July 4th, Vicksburg fell. It was the day after the Battle of Gettysburg. And the first... Union troops to enter the city was the 4th Minnesota Volunteer Infantry. They led the parade. The first Union flag to go into Vicksburg was from the 4th Minnesota. Come back to me. So that's really, it was Vicksburg that really, really, really put Grant on the map. So then where do you go from here? Where do you go from Vicksburg? You just laid siege to the most important city on the Mississippi River. Now the Union Navy had unfettered access from the top of the Mississippi, from uh, uh, Lake Itasca, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And back then, you really only had three modes of transportation. You had the wagon overland route, you had the uh, railroads, but that was they were still... They were still important, they were still coming on, but it was still relatively new technology. And then you also had steamboats. So if you're going to move materials and troops, food, ammunition, you're going to either do it over land, you're going to do it by water, and you're, or you're going to do it by railroad. The first thing that was cut off was water. You couldn't get troops or ammunition or food or other supplies up and down the Mississippi River if you were a Confederate now that it was safely in Union control. That's why Vicksburg was so important. But then after that, they moved on a railroad hub. Uh, Corinth, Mississippi was a railroad hub and it was abandoned. Uh, Halleck himself, after uh, Shiloh, had taken control of the operations at Corinth and well, the Confederates abandoned Corinth, but it wasn't as effective as when Grant was in charge. That was part of what led to Grant coming back. So now the next logical thing was to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. So you had the Tennessee River, and you had, I think it was like five railroads all converged in uh, Chattanooga. And it was the central location for the entire eastern seaboard for Confederate supply traffic. If you 
if you wanted to get troops or food from Florida and Georgia into the Army of, the, uh, of Northern Virginia, in Virginia, you need to go through Chattanooga. That's where the railroad went. If you wanted to go and fortify Corinth or some of the more frontier locations in the Western Theater, you got to go through Corinth. So uh, you got to go through Chattanooga. Chattanooga and Corinth were two of the most important supply depots of the entire Confederacy. And I would add a third one, which is kind of taken right away, and that would have been Nashville. And Nashville s served to be a very important hub for the Union Army in the Western Theater. So in November, on November 24th, 25th of 1863, just a few months after the Siege of Vicksburg and, and the fall of Vicksburg, the Union Army had fortified Chattanooga. Mind you, in September of 63, there was a major battle fought just on the other side of the Georgia line at uh, Chickamauga. And from Chickamauga, the Union retreated back into uh, southern Tennessee, and the Confederacy followed. The Confederates, as you see on the map in the red, they had a large presence on top of Missionary Ridge, which overlooks the Tennessee River and the town of Chattanooga. And if you look at it a little bit to the south, where there's a little bit of red, that's Lookout Mountain. And if you're on Lookout Mountain, you also have a very big vantage point uh, over um, Chattanooga. That's where the Confederates were. They controlled the heights. Uh, matter of fact, one quick side story on uh, Lookout Mountain. I had driven to Lookout Mountain, on top of Lookout Mountain, my little uh, Hyundai Accent. This is back in 2013, I believe. And I made it up on the top of Lookout Mountain just fine. There, is, there, there are roads there. And I made it fine, looked around, took photos. There's actually a famous photo of Grant leaning on a tree overlooking Chattanooga. It was taken from Lookout Mountain. Uh, the tree is still there. I've seen it. I took photos of it. You can't exactly go and get your photo taken with that same tree because of safety reasons. But nonetheless, I mean, it was for me a treat to be there. Then I drove down Lookout Mountain and my foot was constantly on the brake pedal and I could smell the burning brake shoes for the next 150 miles of my trip. So I would not recommend driving onto the top of Lookout Mountain if you're ever in Chattanooga. There are other avenues of approach, but I would highly recommend if you're ever in the area to stop by. I think you'll never regret that. But anyhow, getting back to the battle, the Union Army fortified Chattanooga, the Confederates are on Missionary Ridge, and who led the assault? We talk often in Minnesota about the charge of the first Minnesota at Gettysburg. But the fact is, we had a charge of the second Minnesota at Missionary Ridge. The leader of that charge actually received the Medal of Honor for his efforts. And so when the second Minnesota charged on Missionary Ridge, that led to more and more troops following suit. And pretty soon the uh, Confederates were pretty much kicked off the ridge and Chattanooga was then secured. So now a very important vital link for the Confederates had fallen. And it came back again to Grant laying siege. And at that point in time, things were falling apart in the Eastern Theater. So here we are in the West with uh, Ulysses Grant pretty much kicking Confederate butt by laying siege. Takes time, but it was effective. And then in the North, nothing was really happening. Now we already had a number of Union commanders change over. Started off with Winfield Scott, who was the uh, uh, general leading in uh, the war with Mexico, but that was like 20 years ago. Winfield Scott was on his retirement uh, upon his retirement when the war broke out in 61, Scott gave the unions the, the Union the Anaconda Plan, which was a blockade of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf Coast, followed with taking the Mississippi River, which Grant accomplished with Vicksburg, and then the rest was an overland campaign to crush the Confederate Army. So you essentially do a major siege to starve them out, make sure they couldn't get any supplies from any other country, 
and made it more difficult to supply themselves within uh, the Confederacy. And then you slowly stomp them out. Winfield Scott retired, and then um, you had a series of commanders, um, starting with Bull Run, and I can't remember the commander's name, uh, at Bull Run, but after that, then we had uh, McClellan. And McClellan went on to the Peninsular Campaign. He took a lot of time to train his troops, but he wouldn't necessarily commit his troops to battle. And it was a constant fight with Lincoln. And then by the summer of 1862, that was when Lincoln and uh, Henry Halleck had decided to split the army. So they took some of the Army of the Potomac and moved them into another army under uh, Major General John Pope. And it was Pope's army that had fought at Manassas in the second Battle of Bull Run. And Pope was defeated and didn't make the best of opportunities. The Peninsula Campaign ended, and so then the Army of the Potomac became united again, and McClellan was still in command. And then they went up to Antietam in September of 1862, and McClellan had General Order Number 191 from General Lee, that was left behind in a cigar wrapper that a couple of uh, corporals from, Indi from an Indiana regiment had recovered. So essentially, McClellan knew what Lee's battle plan at Antietam was, but he left the entire V Corps in reserve and didn't crush the Confederacy, or the uh, Army of Northern Virginia, when he had, had the chance. And then after Antietam, even though it was a Union victory, he didn't go anywhere. This is September 17th, and it was not until like the 26th of October that the army was getting back on the move. So November 8th of 1862, Lincoln removed McClellan, put General Burnside. Burnside moved down to Fredericksburg and then fought the Battle of Fredericksburg but uh, was too slow in taking the heights at Fredericksburg and ended up doing a frontal assault against a well-fortified enemy. And Burnside was waiting for pontoon uh, boats to be constructed to cross the river when all he had to do was march five miles north on the Rappahannock River and he had a shallow ford he could have crossed, but he didn't take advantage of the terrain. So that was a big defeat. Then they went into winter camp and then in... Uh, January, January 20th, 1863, Burnside tried flank, a flanking maneuver against Lee's uh, dug-in troops. That was called the Mud March because as soon as he got the army on the road, it rained. Well, then five days later, Burnside resigned. John Reynolds was given the opportunity to command. Reynolds declined because mainly because I, he just wanted to be with his troops. He didn't want to deal with the politics of being so close to Washington. And all the while, Grant is in the West picking up victories. This is the, politi the political nature of the Army of the Potomac in the East. So then uh, the command went to uh, Joseph Hooker. Hooker had the Army of the Potomac through Chancellorsville. He had done some reorganization from January through uh, April, and then by the time the uh, roads cleared, he was going to do a flank attack, kind of what uh, Burnside was going to do in January. And then it was Robert E. Lee's right-hand man, Thomas J. Jackson, nicknamed Stonewall, who uh, charged on the 11th Corps in a surprise attack and the 11th Corps of the Army of the Potomac broke and ran, and that became a, a, a route of the Union Army. In the meantime, at the headquarters at Chancellorsville, Hooker ended up getting too close to an inbound shell and had a concussion, and the concussion, and I've had three concussions in my life, so I'll tell you, when you're dealing with a concussion, you cannot make rational decisions. And that's the problem that um, Hooker had. His bell was rung. So Chancellorsville ended in a defeat. But the armies had been fighting in the same general vicinity for two years. With the exception of moving up north to Antietam, it was still in that same general area. 
and it would continue to later on, but this was an opportunity now for Lee to move forward north. Get out of Fredericksburg and try to get the army to follow him and take the war over to Union soil. And he uh, set his army in motion slowly and quietly on the 1st of June, and they made it into, uh, into Pennsylvania. They were marching on Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania. And was, uh, six days later, or five days later, was when the uh, Army of the Potomac started their move north. And then on, January, on uh, June 28, 1863, was when uh, Hooker was removed from command, offered his resignation, and then uh, it was accepted. And then George Gordon Meade took over the Army, and two days later they were uh, at Gettysburg. Three-day battle, July 1st through 3rd of 1863, was Gettysburg. 165,000 troops were committed between the two armies with just under 31% total casualty rate between the two. But then after that, Meade didn't, Meade took the time rightfully to uh, rest his army, but then he was slow to advance on, um, on Lee. Lee was doing everything he could to get his wagon trains out. The wagon train of, uh, from Gettysburg for the Confederates was 14 miles long, just of the wounded alone. That's a lot of wagons. Again, in the meantime, what's happening in, in the Western Theater? Grant is moving forward. So then finally, in March of 64, Lincoln pretty much had figured out that he had a general who can fight, Ulysses Grant. And we'll go to the next slide. March 8th, 1864, Grant was promoted commander-in-chief commander in chief of the armies. And from then, he put the army in motion to get into the best position to fight. And they started off with um, a campaign in the wilderness in Spotsylvania Courthouse. And that was, that's over by uh, Fredericksburg. He had one Union victory, one Confederate victory. And then just outside of Richmond, uh, that was the Battle of Cold Harbor. Lincoln, or, or, or Grant was considered to be, or was given the nickname the Butcher because he committed so many troops in an open field. That was not Grant's modus operandi. That was Lee's. Lee understood how to fight o across open ground. But Grant had his strategy, and, that, and Lee took advantage of operating with his strength, which happened to have been Grant's weakness. And then they went down to Petersburg. And at Petersburg, that was when Grant had the best opportunity to employ his strategy. And uh, next slide. And so here we have uh, um, a series of battle, okay, I just covered that, uh, overland, Wilderness and Overland Campaign, a lot of activity, and then in June 16, 1864, that was when Grant had trapped Lee in Petersburg, surrounded him, and then uh, that lasted until April 2nd. Uh, like Vicksburg, numerous assaults took place against the Confederate lines. There were some uh, incursions like the Battle of the Mine, also known as the Battle of the Crater, uh, the Weldon Railroad, Fort Stedman, but neither side really budged. And Petersburg was another supply hub. There were five railroads that converged at that one point. So just like Chattanooga, just like Corinth, uh, just like Nashville, here we have a major area of transportation that was taken. And the Confederate troops were decimated and starving. There were no reinforcement in troops, food or ammunition coming for the Confederates. That's the way it was when Grant was surrounding you. You're not going to really be able to do a whole lot. I'm going to take a look right now at a video uh, about the Siege of Petersburg. And we'll give our producer just a moment of time to get it together here. Video number two. By the spring of 1865, indeed ever since late 1864, the siege had assumed strategic dimensions. 
Grant made this clear in his letter of December 18th to his trusted subordinate and friend, William T. Sherman, who had just completed his devastating march to the sea. My own opinion, wrote the general in chief, and now we're quoting General Grant, my own opinion is that Lee is averse to going out of Virginia. And if the cause of the South is lost, he wants Richmond to be the last place surrendered. If Lee has such views, it may be well to indulge him until we get everything else in our hands. The siege thus became a strategic tool for fixing the Southerners in place in the Old Dominion, while Sherman, Philip H. Sheridan, and George H. Thomas devoured the rest of the Confederacy. By March of 1865, Sherman had shoved the Western Theater all the way from Tennessee deep into North Carolina, while in the Eastern Theater, Lee remained pinned at Petersburg. That is the essence of a strategic siege. So Grant understood Lee well enough to know what, you know, how to handle the end. Finally, on April 2nd, 1865, after what, a 10 month, nine month, 11 month, I'm not even doing the math right now, a long siege, almost a year long, Lee managed to escape from Petersburg. And let's take a look at the next slide right here. And this is the beginning of the end. So we had, um, from Petersburg, March 25th, we had the Battle of Fort Stedman on your far right. And then if you look uh, just a little bit to the southwest, you get Battle of Fort Gregg. And then from there was Battle of Sutherland Station also on April 2nd. And then uh, you had a Battle of White Oak Road that was, um, even though that was in March. Battle of Five Forks, Battle of Namazine Church, and then if you see, you had Grant and Ord, they pretty much had the southern route. Meade and Sheridan had uh, the northern route of the uh, two blue bands. And then the Confederates were uh, moving however they could to try to all uh, join up together. And so then finally, you had the Battle of Sailor's Creek on April 6th of 1865. So four days after breaking out of Petersburg, that's where they were. And then right after that, you had the Battle of High Bridge, and then the Battle of Cumberland Church, and then up to the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse on April 8th. It was at that point in time when both the Union and the Confederate armies had all regrouped, and Lee was surrounded. He escaped, he fought off a series of engagement, but he was greatly outnumbered and with a very hungry and tired and exhausted army that was running out of ammunition, even though a lot of his other generals wanted him to keep fighting, he was greatly outnumbered, and there was just no way that Lee was going to be able to win a victory here, and he knew it, and he was forced to admit defeat, and he surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. That was April 9th, 1865. Next slide. The McLean family, they had moved from Manassas Junction after two major battles had destroyed their farm in northeastern Virginia. Uh, they started a new life in the quiet western Virginia town of Appomattox Courthouse, but they could still not escape the war. However, there, are, there is some recent scholarship that suggests that Wilmer McLean, who had owned property at which the Battle of Bull Run was fought over, uh, he was actually a neighbor of a grandfather of mine, uh, it sounds like he may have actually purchased that a little bit closer to the uh, end of the war, hoping that you know, he could capitalize on the opportunity. I, I'm not sure exactly which the truth is behind each, either of those stories, and I have not really had the time to really investigate, but I find it interesting that McLean was able to have the uh, war beginning and ending essentially on his property in two different locations in the same state. Uh, next slide. Grant and Lee met in the McLean parlor and they arranged the terms of surrender. 
though there were a few last scattered battles in other places which we will touch on, this essentially was the end of the Civil War. By that time, Jefferson Davis and his cabinet, they had uh, evacuated uh, Richmond, and Richmond had fallen. Lincoln actually went to Richmond and was greeted by uh, hundreds of uh, now free black people who had uh, considered it the time of Jubilee and they looked upon Lincoln as their great savior, which he was, and the Confederates were now on the run. Uh, Jefferson Davis had escaped, I think, first into North Carolina, then into Georgia, and the Confederate government continued to try to meet, but there wasn't really much left. And that's, that was the last days. Uh, part of the terms of surrender, if we go to the next slide, was that Lee's hungry men were allowed to return to their homes and farms to face an uncertain future. They were even allowed to keep their, uh, their weaponry because Grant knew that they're still going to need them as hunting rifles. And as long as they're not going to be in rebellion and, and reform as an army, you can keep your rifle if you just go home. Leave. Go home. Go raise your family. The war's over. These guys were starving. They really didn't have too much of a fight left in them. And most of these guys walked home. It, you know, in Appomattox, Virginia, when they were told to go home, there was no organized transportation for them. They all just walked. There's some guys who walked from uh, Virginia to Mississippi and Alabama. That was how you got home. Next slide. We had a lot of jubilation in the North. The year of Jubilee has come. Next slide. And then you also had, uh, oh, well, this is Lincoln's visit with Richmond. Uh, he was greeted as a great emancipator and for uh, former slaves and free blacks alike. Next slide. There were refugees all over the South, both black and white. Next slide. At this point in time, it didn't matter all, uh, what, you know, as far as uh, color and prejudice. What mattered was the fact that the South lay in ruins. If you see on the bottom left, you had its transportation system was ruined by war. Next slide. Its economy and banking system was decimated. Its agricultural system was decimated. Next slide. It's few factories, churches, public buildings. They're all destroyed. Here we have a photo on the next slide. Ruins in Charleston, South Carolina. That's the way it looked. That was the that was South Carolina at the end of the Civil War. World War II. It looked a lot like Europe in World War II. And then the next slide we have Richmond, Virginia, photographed on April 3, 1865, right after the city surrendered. That's what it looked like. Now, when I mention we're going to come back to other battles, let's take a quick look at the next slide. Uh, this was the landscape, really, of the southern and western theaters. This, you know, I, I like this map with its perspective. But if you can find uh, Atlanta, put the cursor on Atlanta. Okay, in July through September of 1864, you had the, uh, actually really June to September of uh, 1864, you had the Atlanta campaign. After the Atlanta campaign, John Bell Hood led the Confederate Army of Tennessee up to Decatur, Alabama, where he crossed the Tennessee River, a little bit to your left, and then from there went up to Franklin, Tennessee, due north, and, there, and ended up having a stunning defeat there. His goal was Nashville, and he fought the last major battle, December 15th and 16th of 1864 in Nashville. And you had four regiments of Minnesota troops who charged upon Shy's Hill and effectively kicked the uh, Confederates off of Shy's Hill. And that really was monumental in ending the Battle of Nashville. And the Confederate Army of Tennessee was pretty much no more. And then they all went, the, rem the remnant moved over towards North Carolina to link up with the army over there. But go back to Atlanta, what you had 
uh, when Hood went towards Decatur, Alabama, Sherman went down to Savannah, Georgia. And then from Savannah, Georgia, he made his way up to Columbia, South Carolina, and then uh, up to Fayetteville, North Carolina, Bentonville. And at the time that Lee surrendered to Grant, the Confederates surrendered to Sherman in Raleigh, North Carolina. The Confederates in North Carolina were trying to link up with Lee to try to stave off another, and, and make another grand battle, but they ran out of time. And that was really you know, the effective end. The march to the sea took away a lot of supplies, burned the fields. That was the South at the end of the Civil War. And next slide. In Washington, D.C., People were thankful that the war was over. They were hopeful for Reconstruction. However, on Good Friday evening in 1865 at Ford's Theater, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth while watching the play Our American Cousin. Next slide. Booth, he jumped from the uh, presidential box after shooting uh, Lincoln and then ran out on a 12-day escape. And he was at large, but he was discovered over at a tobacco barn in uh, Virginia and was pretty much burned into surrendering and he died a short time later, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> so the next slide, as all that was going on, Lincoln, this is kind of, uh, was supposed to be the, the 1865 equivalent of uh, what we would consider Air Force One today. President Lincoln had his own presidential railroad car. Railroads were the newest technology and, you know, for transportation, and he had his own car, but the only time he ever used it was in order to uh, have his casket with his remains carried back to Springfield, Illinois. Now, uh, Thomas Lowry, of Lowry Hill fame in Minneapolis, uh, he met Lincoln when he was, I think, 12 years old in 1858 uh, at the Lincoln-Douglas debate, and he was in awe of Lincoln. And sometime you know, years later, he was able to buy that funeral car. And he had it hauled up to Minneapolis. And then in 1911, the most unfortunate thing happened. A, um, a um, brush fire broke out, and the, uh, the um, building that was housing the railroad car in Columbia Heights, Minnesota, was consumed by fire and the funeral car was gone. It was burned up in a major fire. Uh, next slide. So there's uh, Lewis Powell. He had attacked uh, Secretary of State uh, William, William H. Seward. Uh, he was part of the conspiracy with Booth and all of the conspirators were rounded up and brought to trial. And as that was going on, May of 1865, the Union Army took two days to have a major grand review before they were all returning home. And here we see some infantry units passing on Pennsylvania Avenue. And then after that, a month later, you had uh, the execution of the conspirators and Lincoln's assassination. And we really, at that point, it was a matter of now reconstructing the South because uh, there was a lot of damage and you had a lot of political things that were going on between the treatment of free blacks, you had the need to rebuild the economy in the South, the transportation system. There's just a lot of moving pieces going on. All the while, you have a pro-Southern sympathizer as the new president, Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson was a former Democrat. He was not exactly the most well-liked guy. And he was impeached. And he was brought to a Senate trial. But he managed to uh, survive his impeachment by one vote. And he served out the rest of his term, but he was not going to get reelected. And that was when Ulysses Grant became the new president. Here he was, the conquering hero of the South. Major victories in the Civil War were all had Grant as the leader. And so it was Grant who the nation turned to.
And so the country, if we bring the slides back up, the country debated what was to become of the former slaves. Next slide. Next one. And under Congressional Reconstruction, the freedmen were given the right to vote in the South. Next slide. Southerners did have other ideas. This is the origin of the Ku Klux Klan. Next slide. And then we see in Harper's Weekly in 1874 an image. But it was Grant who said, ah, no, we're not going to put up with that. And he actually had pushed for legislation uh, to abolish the KKK. Uh, he did that early on, uh, right after they were established. And then next slide. You know, after Reconstruction, many whites sought a return to pre-Civil War social structures and ushered in Jim Crow. So they essentially looked at the uh, freed blacks and says, well, yeah, you're, you're, you're technically free, but we're going to find a way to uh, push you into low-paying jobs uh, like tenant farming and sharecropping. We're not going to give you the equal opportunities that you have with being a free citizen, even though you do have a right to vote, and they were s treated as second-class citizens. Next slide. And then you have the story of Robert Smalls, who I think is really the most compelling story of the entire Civil War. Here, in 1862, he uh, helped, uh, he, 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 at that time he was hired out to, from one uh, slave owner to another, kind of on a rental system, to the, USS, or the CSS Planter, which was a small uh, vessel for the Confederate Navy. And he, Smalls, had figured out as a crew mem that he would be able to pilot the planter past the Confederate points and surrender it to the Union and maybe get his freedom. And so he led this, um, this uh, rebellion against the, the Confederates and he was successful. And he was paraded around the North as a conquering hero. And that was uh, May 13th, 1862. So we just passed the anniversary a couple of days ago. Uh, after the war, Isaac uh, uh, um, Smalls, he uh, went into business in Beaufort, South Carolina with Richard Howell Gleaves, a businessman from Philadelphia, and they opened a store to, how, to serve the needs of freedmen. Uh, Smalls also hired a teacher to help him study. And then in 1868, he became a state representative in the state of South Carolina. He was a Republican. He became a state senator and then a major general in the South Carolina militia. And then from 1875 to 79, and again from 1882 to 1883, he became a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, representing South Carolina's 5th Congressional District. And then 1884 to 1887, he became the congressman from the 7th Congressional District. So here you have a man who was born into slavery, who assisted in the war effort, and I didn't mention that, he did pilot the planter and the USS Isaac Smith for the U.S. Navy during the remainder of the war. And so Robert Smalls has a very incredible story. This is the kind of stuff in the modern era that we should, when we look back at the Civil War period, this is the stuff we should be celebrating. You know, we've discussed in the past about getting rid of Confederate memorials and everything is about, oh, slavery and writing it out of our textbook. Now, this is the story that we need to be talking about, how one man was able to be born into slavery and then assist the U.S. government at the risk of his own life for his freedom and then get rewarded with a seat in Congress to represent people black and white. This is the most compelling story of the Civil War and the reason we really need to take a closer look at this time period. We're going to actually take a look right now about the life and legacy of Robert Smalls. It'll take just a second. Well, the long civil rights movement, though, actually does go back to, to people like Robert Smalls, who indeed were trying to pass and propose legislation that would give African Americans equal opportunity to, to, to work, equal opportunity in public accommodations, as you've heard, uh, equal access to, to the ballot, and basically dignity. And Smalls' his own life sort of, sort of sets the, the tone for that, in that he was a, a, a fighter. He, he challenged discrimination every opportunity and every chance that he, he got. Now, some of you know, I, as, as you heard Helen say this morning, I worked with um, 
her family to develop the, the ex exhibition that is now at the, the Charleston Museum. So I spent a year with Robert Smalls, you might say. That is, re reading all of his works, looking for his pictures, reading everything that I, I could about him. And, and again, as you've heard, this, this man was a very unique individual in that he, he put to lie some of the beliefs about slavery in this country, some of the beliefs about African-American talent and abilities in this country, at a time, basically, when most people felt if you were black, you were inferior. In fact, Smalls had one of his colleagues in the house tell him that. And of course, he challenged him on, on the spot. So um, Robert Smalls, as I said, has, has had a tremendous impact on the historiography, on, on Reconstruction, and on the, on the Civil Rights Movement. And Smalls was a loyal Republican. On August 22nd, 1912, he wrote a letter to Minnesota U.S. Senator Newt Nelson. And in that letter he said, quote, I never lose sight of the fact that had it not been for the Republican Party, I never would have been an office holder of any kind from 1862 to the present. And the words uh, that became famous, he described his party as the party of Lincoln, which unshackled the necks of four million human beings. And he wrote this line on September 12, 1912, in a letter expressing his anxiety over the looming presidential election. And he concluded this, uh, another letter with, quote, I ask that every colored man in the North who has a vote to cast would cast that vote for the regular Republican Party and thus bury the Democratic Party so deep that there will not be seen even a bubble coming from the spot where the burial took place. That was Robert Smalls. But Robert Smalls decided he was not going to be a victim. He was going to take matters into his own hands, and he did. He did not subscribe to victimhood. But that's all we seem to have out of the Democratic Party of today. Everyone's a victim. And then, of course, uh, you, we're not allowed to teach American exceptionalism. So in our schools, we're not allowed to talk about Robert Smalls because he actually made something for himself, and he did not rely on the Democratic Party apparatus in order to get him there. We talk about American exceptionalism when we look at guys like Robert Smalls as those exceptional Americans that we really need to praise and to pattern our lives after. The Democratic Party doesn't want that. They want you to subscribe to victimhood. And victimhood is very much uh, like the Jim Crow South. I'm not going to go as far as saying it was like slavery. No, it's more like Jim Crow. That's what victimhood does. And now the Democratic Party of today, the victimhood, does not necessarily have to mean along racial lines. Even though we do know that you know, a lot of the blacks in the inner cities are victims of the Democratic machine. But I also know plenty of white people who are just as much victims of the Democrat machine as well. Let's go ahead and not let people, uh, let, let's parade around because abortion is a big topic. Let's just go ahead and kill kids before they get out of the womb. We're going to kill grandma because we're going to subscribe to euthanasia. But we're going to bring in more uh, immigrants that we can't vet from overseas simply because we have a low birth rate here and we need people to fill jobs. We're going to let criminals go free, but then uh, we, gotta, we, we can't defend ourselves and so we've got to have anti-war. So what is up with the Democratic Party? And we, can, we get penalized for looking at success. Robert Smalls got it right. He got it right. The party of Lincoln unshackled from the necks of the necks of four million human beings. And they still do that today. North Star Oasis, I'm your host, Jeff Williams for Dallas Pearson, producer. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.